Welcome back to the 21 Convention 10 year anniversary special event in Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker has been recommended to me many, many, many times over, which as you guys can imagine is not unusual for me to be recommended a speaker. Over the past months and in years, I've paid attention to his name being sent my way many, many times for many different people, many different men, uh, alumni speakers, friends, investors, uh, all kinds of people. And I pay attention to that over time, both the relationship from the person sending me the recommendation, as well as the frequency. I mention this because I don't know if I've been recommended a speaker more times than this guy, from more people across a wider diversity of uh, you know, relationships to me, and just again and again and again. So I think it's about damn time we had Johnny Soporno on the stage. Without further ado, give it up for Johnny Soporno. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, folks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very happy that the time was, uh, was available and I get to address you folks and share some of the things that I think are pretty important. Some of them are going to be completely congruent and on side with a lot of other things that other people have said. And some things are going to seem to fly directly in the face of some of the things that you've heard from other people here. I'm not going to tell you that my answers are more correct than anyone else's. I'm going to let you figure out what makes sense for you and build from that. I'm not in the business of reshaping people over in my image. I have no interest in that at all. In fact, I often say that my job is I get to make friends for a living. People show up at my door because they're not happy enough in their life. Despite the fact they may be tremendous business successes, they may be highly credible in lots of ways, they may have all of the trappings of success, they generally are not happy with themselves for one or another reason, or sometimes they're not happy with other people. Specifically, they're not happy with women, for instance, or whichever. My job is to take them as though they were some assembly required and help them unbuild themselves so that they can figure out better ways to reassemble and become more the person that they'd like to be, the person they have the potential to be, and the person that they're most happy being. Because at the end of every day, you're winning the game of life when you're simultaneously happy and self-satisfied. Self-satisfaction is tremendously underrated in the world. Most people think of a person as being successful if other people think they've gained notoriety and celebrity and wealth and power. And they rarely think that the person is not actually successful if they feel crappy about themselves and they aren't enjoying their life. We talk about the trappings of success. These are the expensive condo, the expensive car, the expensive girlfriend, the things that other people admire and say, ooh, I wish I could have that. But those things are very high maintenance. And anyone who wants to have these things has to understand that they become constrained by the existence of these things. Wow, I'll no longer have my identity if I quit my crappy job, which I hate, which I do 70 hours a week, so I can afford to have the trappings of success. I can't allow myself to lose all these things that buoy me up and make me seem important to other people because if I don't seem important to other people, what good am I? We call that narcissistic personality disorder in the psychology world. And in fact, an awful lot of people, particularly people in the men's personal development circles, have tended to become trapped on the endless trend of treadmill of thinking of themselves as pickup artists. I became very famous in the community in 2006 or 2007, I think it was, when I got on stage. In my mind, a pickup artist is semantically equivalent to a con artist, only working in the arena of the sexual predator. Why do I say this? Because a pickup artist goes out to meet women, to present himself to women as though he was something highly desirable and, and something that women would want, suggesting that he's going to be the kind of guy who's going to be there for them. And then as soon as he gets what he's after, he disappears. Well, that's a con artist, right? So that bothered me a lot. 
Because I understand, and I still understand, that what women want least of all, things that no healthy person ever really wants, is to end up feeling used. You spend a bunch of money and time and energy and effort on impressing a girl, or taking her out, treating her really nicely, and she says, I think we should just be friends. And you go, oh! And you feel used, and you get angry, and you feel abused. Well, simultaneously, if a girl goes to bed with you because she likes you, she thinks you're a cool guy. She likes the way you walk. She likes your sense of humor. And she goes to bed with you, and you think, oh, wow, she was too easy. So you don't follow up with her. She feels used. So if you wonder why it is women play games, play hard to get, it's because we have trained them that if they allow us to know they like us for who we are, because none of us have been raised to think we're any damn good at all, we're going to condemn them for their low standards and won't hang around. I call this Marx's paradox, named for the brilliant American philosopher, Groucho Marx, <laughs> who said, I'd never belong to a club that would have a guy like me as a member. <laughs> Not any of you have ever thought, I'd never work for a boss stupid enough to hire me. I wouldn't have a friend with just lousy judgment as have me as a friend. Because you like yourself, you think you're any good. But for some reason, we've all been trained. If a girl likes us for how we actually are, instead of how, how we can appear when we put ourselves on our best behavior, clean our home exactly right, take her out to an expensive place, do all sorts of things to big ourselves up, right? maybe even bullshit her like crazy about how great we are, unless we do that, if she likes us, there's got to be something wrong with her. How could that? She likes me for who I am? Oh, God, if she'd fuck me, she'd fuck anybody. <laughs> because somehow we forget that the people we are are the results of all of the decisions we've made through our lives. All of the things we've learned through trial and error, all of the mistakes, even the ones we hide from ourselves, that we carefully act not to repeat all of the shit we have generated, most of which we tend to carry with us because we're so embarrassed about the mistakes we've made, we won't revisit them, digest them, and then leave them at the side of the road. So we carry them with us, and it makes a terrible cologne, okay? as we try and hide from ourselves our previous mistakes. Because only when you accept and acknowledge your mistakes are you ever likely to stop making them. Because you recognize what you've done that didn't work, I'm not going to do that again. And usually by the second or third time, we actually do stop making those same mistakes. So if a woman meets you and she likes you for who you are, she's attentive and sensitive and able to recognize that you're a quality person based on the things that she's interested in and she cares about in the moment. She's having a good time with you. She may not be thinking, wow, I want to have this guy's babies. She might be thinking, I'd like to go through the motions. The truth is, accepting that women are rational, reasonable people who want essentially exactly the same thing we do, which is a good time without its costing us on a primal level. We want to enjoy ourselves and feel respected and appreciated, not condemned, not that our reputation is damaged. Not that future people won't want to have anything to do with us because we've clearly devalued ourselves. They want the same things we want. They want to have a good time. They want to enjoy themselves. They want to have sex for fun without it hurting them. Now, as soon as you make peace with this, then you can start presenting it to women that you understand and appreciate it. There are two questions I'm asked by women more often than any other questions. I'm asked them almost by every woman I meet at some point during the time we're talking. And the two questions are, why aren't more men like you? And my answer uniformly, 100% of the time, is I'm working on it. <laughs> and that's what I'm working on. I don't want you to be like me across the board, but I'd very much like for you to be like me in that you are self-accepting and you recognize that other people's appreciating you for who you are 
means they're better people than the ones who can't appreciate you for who you are. The second question I'm asked by almost every girl that I start to get to know is, why me? Why me? You could clearly have any girl in this place. And I find that very funny because while I know they're right, to the standard person looking at me from outside, I don't look like much. I'm heavy, I'm balding, I'm old, I'm furry in ways that maybe are not desirable. I've got almost a full head of hair on my shoulders. One day I'll do you a comb over, I'm sure of it. <laughs> and yet, women never give a crap about what I look like as long as I look like I meant to look like that. As long as you don't smell bad and you look like you meant to look the way you do, women are incredibly forgiving. It doesn't matter if you've got an issue. I have a simple rule about this. If you can't fix it, feature it. I'm very ADD, scatterbrained as could be. I make sure everyone knows this up front. This way, they don't think that I'm being disrespectful or inattentive. I'm just a flake. In fact, I was going to tell you, oh, look, there's a squirrel. No, uh, so on, on, on the more serious side of things, we as men have bought into a whole bunch of crappy, crappy programming. As, as, as Alan said yesterday, social programming. We have a bunch of rules that we accept, things that we know are true. We know, for example, that there's no pride in hooking up with a girl that other men call a slut. This is, of course, insane. Slut is a null word. It, it only exists to cause pain. When a man calls a woman a slut, it means she's having more sex than I would like for her to be having. Your wife's fucking the gardener and not you? She's only having sex with one person, but that's still one more person than you'd like? She's a slut. Wait, Sally? You're telling me you want to go out with Sally? I heard that she had sex with Bill and George last year. She's a slut. Now, why do I say this about Sally? Because she wouldn't go to bed with me. And I don't want you going to bed with her. That would shame me even worse. So I'm going to try and scare you off so that I don't have to deal with one of my friends getting what I couldn't get. Okay? So when a man calls a woman a slut, for the woman it means, well, she's not going to like that guy anymore, and it does suggest that other men might imagine that there's some reality to this, and therefore they'll lose interest in her, or they'll think they can get something from her without having to provide anything. In other words, they're going to feel they can use her, and this doesn't make anyone feel good, the belief that other people are going to try and take advantage of them. It's a crappy feeling and a terrible situation. But it's really not that important when a woman is called a slut by a man. It's when a woman is called a slut by another woman that it's a big deal. Them's fighting words. Because okay? when a woman refers to another woman as a slut, she's actually saying, you're a traitor to your gender. You're a scab to the union of women. You're making sex available for less than the value of security, and therefore making it impossible for me to have a market for my sex. I need for men to provide my security. I need them to sponsor me. Okay. Daddy was my sponsor when I was a little girl. As I grew to be an adult, eventually the man whose name I'm going to substitute daddies with will be my new sponsor. His job will be to provide me with safety and security so I can do whatever I like. And just like I did with Daddy, I know my job because I will love this man just as I love Daddy. I will be attentive to him and I will do everything I can to keep him happy just as I did with Daddy. And usually for young women who have understood from childhood their job is to make sure that they please other people. The way they do this is by telling them what they want to hear and keeping from them the stuff they know they don't want to hear. Overwhelmingly, most of you guys are frustrated by the fact that women seem to flake a lot. They'll say, sure, I'll go and see this movie with you, or I'll go with you and do this, I'll do this, and they don't respond to your calls, they don't call you back, they don't respond to your emails, and they never show up for these events. You go, holy shit. Well, guess what, guys? They do it to each other all the time. Women tend not to learn how confidently to say, no. 
Because saying no frustrates the other person and makes them unhappy. And women are raised through crappy social programming to imagine their job is to keep other people happy with them. So if your job is to keep people happy with you, and the easiest way to keep people happy with you is by telling them what they want to hear. Hey, you want to go see this show with me on Thursday? Oh, sure, I'd love to. Now, as long as you hide out till after Thursday, everyone's happy except the person who you said yes to who took you seriously. But that's okay, they'll learn. Okay. This is a fantastic and awful reality. This is not any woman's fault. It's that society at large teaches women at an early age a few things that are fundamentally corrupted and very problematic. If you ever wonder why men think women are crazy, most women think women are crazy too. Most women eventually think they're themselves to be crazy from time to time because they're trying to operate according to a rule base that makes no sense. In logic, if your axioms, the fundamentals of your philosophy, are contradictory, you can prove anything. If you can prove one is equal to zero or true is equal to false, you can prove anything. And of course, the results are entirely spurious. There's no value to them. In our society, women understand if they do what makes sense to them, if they do what they'd like to do, if they do what feels right for them, invariably they will be decried as having no self-respect because they're not doing what society tells them to do. I'll explain that further in a moment, but guys, if someone says to me, hey, I'm doing this, it's radical and out there and not normal, but it's working, I'll say, that's great. You've got a lot of self-respect. You're prepared to abandon convention and do what worked for you. Because after all, conformity is the confluence of cowardice and laziness. Got that? When you're too cowardly to step outside of the standard, when you're afraid of the disapproval of random other people, you do what you're supposed to do. Because if you do what you're supposed to do, you get the approval you're after. The approval you're after usually comes along with rewards. Men crave approval the way women tend to crave security. Now the truth is, there's no freedom for anyone as long as they crave security. Because there's no such thing as security. Security is not a thing. You can't touch it. It doesn't exist in any real sense. Security is a notion, a sensation of safety. Steve Jobs died with, what, $100 billion available to him at 54? How's that security working for him? Right? Money doesn't provide security. Friends don't provide security. He had lots of friends. They couldn't help him. There's no security on this side of the grave, and that's all I can say. I don't know if there's security on the other side of the grave. The closest thing to security is what you can do for yourself to keep yourself afloat and what you can do to inspire other people to have them help you back up in the event you go below the water. That's the only thing that matters. So at the end of every day, in order to be winning this game of life, you have to simultaneously be both happy and self-satisfied. When you're happy and self-satisfied, you'll radiate. Other people will have joy in being around you. If you pay attention to them, they'll consider you so valuable and credible because you actually broadcast, you, you purr silently with joy at being you because you've simultaneously become happy and self-satisfied. You feel you've arrived. You are the person you should be. Sounds so challenging, right? How can you be both happy and feel self-satisfied? We'll get back to that. Now, we have this philosophy across pretty much all cultures that says that there are two paths for women. There are two kinds of women. This is society's rule, not any of us individually, but overall, the overarching theme. Okay, I refer to this as seductive reasoning, and you'll understand why in a moment. We presume that women basically come in two varieties. There's the woman who does what she wants to for her own reasons without concern for social standards, without concern for cultural standards, she leads her life her own way. Perhaps she's a scientist doing 
paleontological digs and has to travel around the world, it wouldn't be a good time to settle down and raise a family. Maybe she's a morning radio host, has to be up at 4 in the morning so she can be on the air at 5.30. So it's very hard to have a traditional relationship with a partner. Or maybe she's not sure what she wants to do. She's just floating through life, taking courses or whatever. But she doesn't settle down and doesn't do what she is supposed to do. But she also doesn't live in abject, chaste celibacy. She has sex because she enjoys sex. She has sex with people who turn her on. She has sex with people because she's bored. She has sex with people because she knows she'll enjoy it. And we say about a woman like this, clearly she has no self-respect because she gives herself away for nothing. Everyone heard this sort of idea? Girl gives herself away for nothing. That girl has sex with whoever amuses her at the time. She has no self-respect. Interestingly, if a man has sex with whomever interests, interests him at the time, he's a hero. <laughs> he has lots of self-respect. But if a woman has sex with people other than the ones she's supposed to, she has no self-respect. We condemn her because she gives herself away for nothing. And there's a nasty four-letter word commonly bandied about, we were discussing it earlier, that is used pretty much uniformly to describe a woman who leads her own life her own way by her own rules and has sex to suit her mood with whomever she chooses. Anyone want to give me that word? There you go, slut. And I generally make sure when I'm describing this model to women, I absolutely ensure they give me that word first because if I give it to them first, they'll fill their drink in my face. But they will give you the word slut. They'll understand it. They'll recognize it. Whether they believe it or not is not important. They certainly know that society teaches us that that girl, the one who leads her own life by her own rules, her own way, and has sex with people for her own amusement, she is condemned. Bad news. Stay away from her. She's a slut. Now, if a girl is a slut because she gives herself away for nothing, and therefore we know she has no self-respect, there is another category of women, the woman who has self-respect, so much so she never gives herself away for nothing. She always charges for it. Anyone want to give me a term for a woman who always charges for it? Oh, okay, that was hard, prostitute, anything. It's all the same thing. So we have two things. We have a wonderful society. We teach women, hey, great news. You've got choice in this world. You could either be a whore or a slut. <laughs> we call that a double bind. It's a crappy situation to be in. But we also give them a bit of an out. You see, there's the low status whore. Right? This is the one who says, well, as long as I'm bringing in it's okay that I'm putting out. I mean, he paid for the corsage and the limo. You know, he paid for the tickets to the show. He paid for the babysitter to take care of my kids. So of course I'm going to have sex with him. Or he promised he'd take me to Alta. We're going to go skiing. Or he got me a better job. Or he did my taxes for me, fixed my brakes for me. Right? He paid my rent, bought me this jewelry. Promised to love me forever. As long as the security is given, or even promised, it's okay that she's providing sexual access. Because in our society, that's much less terrible than she was just having sex with him. At least she has enough value for her JJ that she makes sure she's getting paid for it. Right? Well, you see, there is the other part. There's this wonderful escape clause. We give women this option. They can also, if they have enough confidence in themselves and they can manage to for whatever reason, they can announce to the world that their sex is so valuable, so high profile, so desirable, they're only going to make it available to a single ongoing client in exchange for a lifetime of economic support for themselves and their offspring, whom that client will no doubt imagine are his own. Okay. She doesn't even promise to provide the sex, merely to not publicly make that sex available to anybody else. Okay. We have a nasty four-letter word for that girl, the contract whore, the high-status whore. Can anyone want to tell me what that is? Okay, you guys are right on the money today. This is a good group. Okay. Now, 
You can have this conversation with any number of people, male and female. You can have this conversation with married couples, and you will get. You can have this. You can have this conversation with 75-year-old ladies who are the parents of your friends, and they'll all give you the same words: "slut, whore, and wife." They'll appreciate the reality of this. They'll shake their head, going, "How the fuck did I buy into this my whole life?" Okay. Or they'll shake their head and go, "How the hell does this guy know this?" Or more importantly, "Why don't other men know this?" Because when a girl starts to realize, there's no reason in the world for her to punish herself for enjoying having sex with people she finds interesting. It is insane. Okay? But there's another deeper level, a really insidious one, how this all came to pass. You see, mommy, who very likely was a contract whore, would, would tell her daughters, mustn't be a slut. Nothing is worse than being a slut. Mustn't appear like a slut. If you appear like a slut, people will know they can use you. You'll never be able to find what you're after. Because remember, honey, if you give away the milk, no one will buy the cow. Because don't forget, I raised you to be a whore, not a slut. <laughs> but mommy always forgets to include that last sentence. I'm still not sure why. Now daddy will say something entirely different. He'll say, he'll say don't hook up with Gary over there. He just wants to get in your pants. Hold out for Phil. He's got a good job and a career. He's going places. He'll be able to provide a fine life for you and your children. Because don't forget, I raised you to be a whore and not a slut. <laughs> and again, daddy never bothers to say the line, but he knows deep down, just as mommy does, that their daughter is going to understand it. They're there to be a whore, but they're never going to say it aloud. They're not even going to think it to themselves. Because even though there is no way to escape this logical truth, it's a forbidden concept. Must not consider that sex is supposed to be a trade. A woman vends her sexuality in exchange for security. Now, the truth is, any woman who realizes that it's time to stop pretending to daddy or whoever her sponsor is, that she's going to be well-behaved so as to keep him happy, only then does she transition from being a girl into a woman. A girl becomes a woman when she realizes, as an adult, she's responsible for the results of her decisions. Her decisions give her the validation she wants. And if she has to spend her life pretending to be something she isn't, that's no life at all. When a woman realizes that seeking for security from any place other than what she can do for herself and is, as an individual is crazy because there ain't no security there. All you have is a job with some confidence that it will continue until you're caught doing what you're going to be doing anyway. So with this in mind, a woman becomes free when she realizes the only source of security is she herself. Similarly, a man is not a man until he overcomes his fear of disapproval from people he doesn't admire. Anyone who governs their life concerned about what people who do not matter to them think about them is a child. A boy becomes a man when he realizes that fearing the disapproval of others is a, a strangulation knot around their throat that prevents them from being themselves. And they don't become free until they realize that the only source of security comes from what they do for themselves. And simultaneously, they stop having the craving for approval from other people at all. One of the most powerful things I've got going in my world is I do absolutely nothing to impress anybody. Most people find me tremendously impressive because it's so clear I don't give a shit. <laughs> I am going to be the way I am. I'm completely comfortable with being the person I am. I am 100% honest. I speak the straight dope as best I can see it. I am tactful but direct. I will have conversations with people where there's no way they can fail to appreciate what I'm saying, even if it's something I know they don't want to hear. I'm just cautious in framing it in ways their ego won't reject before they get value from it. OK? 
okay? Because your ego, that little voice inside your head that tells you what you're supposed to think about what you're hearing, in fact, some of you will go, what's he talking about? There's no little voice inside my head telling me that he's not <laughs> Okay. Now, if you start giggling, it's probably because you've just heard that little voice and realized it's there. Okay. The truth is, your ego exists primarily to defend itself against the threat of critical thinking from outside your system. Your ego exists to defend your preconceptions, those things that you know are true, even though you have never explored to prove to yourself that they're true, nor could even explain how you know they're true. They're true because they were told to you by someone who knew. And you have no choice. You learned them so long ago as before you even realized you could question. Grown-ups told you these things. They must be true. Anyone here believe that if you shave with a razor, your hair grows back in thicker and faster? Yeah. Anyone else? We've heard it. Most people have heard it. Thanks to gentlemen like this fellow over here who shave their head regularly, clearly, we discover it's not true. But the truth is, your hair grows in a very flimsy single strand at first from the follicle, which is about four days' growth away from the surface. So on the first day of a brand new hair coming out of the follicle, it's one filament thick. The next day, just like a tree, a second filament's worth of, me of media surrounds the first filament, and it now has a second ring around it, and it's twice as thick. Then the third day, It'll be still thicker, and the fourth day, it'll be thicker still as it gets to be its maximum, about four days' worth of thickness. And then by the time it reaches the surface, you see the wispy one day's worth, and then the next day, if you still haven't shaved, it gets a little thicker. The next day, a little thicker still. The fourth day, it's as thick as it's going to get, and if you shave then, the next day, already four-day thick hair emerges. So it looks like if you pluck out the hair, when it grows back, it grows back in thin and wispy. It's not true. It's just it takes four days for it to get to full, thick, full thickness. It never actually ever gets any thicker. Your hair is completely unaware of how long it is when you cut it. And it doesn't care either way. So we have this thing, all sorts of people throughout the years have accepted this notion. Because when mommy tells her daughter, don't shave your mustache hair, it grows back in thicker and faster. And the girl goes, oh shit. I just shaved my mustache hair, and look, mommy was right. Look how thick it's growing in. Well, it's actually growing in exactly as thick as it was the previous day. But if she plucks it or waxes it, it'll be a week before she starts to have it that thick again. So clearly, that's a better answer. Well, it looks like that's true. It's just not true. Well, there's all sorts of things in our world that if you don't look too carefully, look true, and just aren't true. As Will Rogers, a great American humorist, said, the trouble is not with what we don't know, it's what we know that just ain't so. And there's an awful lot of stuff that we all know that just isn't true. Rather than get too far into that particular set of rabbit holes, I'd like to come back for a moment to things that are more applicable for you guys. See, in order to feel successfulness and therefore be compellingly attractive to other people because people love spending time around other people who clearly feel good about themselves, who clearly like being themselves, who are clearly not constrained by convention, right? In fact, if you look at any celebrity magazine, the stuff people read about, none of those people are operating according to the rules that we all know people are supposed to be following. In fact, if you stop and think about it, if you follow the rules as they've been presented, there's no way to win. There's only a way of staying in the game forever, unhappy and not feeling satisfied. So managing your expectations for yourself is critical. Set your expectations not based on what you'd wistfully like, but what you know right now you can do. And if you set your expectations based on what you can prove to yourself, so that the only reason you'll ever disappoint yourself is if you don't try. Because as long as you're putting in best efforts, you're always going to be able to satisfy yourself. And in fact, you'll continually get better and better. 
the longer you continue trying, you're going to keep discovering. You're going to get better and better for most of your life. And then it sort of tapers off at the end. But by that point, you've probably become pretty satisfied. Okay? So it's an amazing thing. Feeling good about yourself comes from making reasonable decisions for yourself, being confident enough in yourself to put them into place, not worrying about what other people think about them unless those people are people you admire as individuals, your dear friends, people you consider credible, people you hire as consultants, people who've done it well before you, people who operate as your guides. So you can go and seek those people out, get their feedback. But don't take their word as though it were the literal word of God. Plenty of people who are experts are also wrong. Plenty of people who are experts also don't think too far out of the box from what they've done. And interestingly enough, there are lots of ways to skin cats. I'm not particularly recommending it. I'm a big fan of cats. But, <laughs> but you can accomplish the same thing through lots of different ways. Some of them are more effective than others. Some of them are more efficient than others. When you reach the confluence of efficiency and effectiveness, the optimal solution, we call that elegant. It's a wonderful term. I always strive for elegant solutions because elegant solutions require very little investment and play out consistently. They work because they should, because by design, they make sense. But for most people in most aspects of our life, very few things can be described as elegant. Interestingly, your career in any standard larger organization almost invariably is saddled by something called Parkinson's Law, also called the Peter Principle. It says that within a large organization, everyone always rises to their level of incompetency. You'll get promoted if you're any good at your job, and then You'll keep getting promoted from that job to the next job to the next job to the next job until you're no longer good enough at that job to be promoted, at which point that's where you'll stay. Right? So if you're a great kindergarten teacher, they'll put you up to middle school. If you're a good middle school teacher, they'll put you up to high school. If you're an okay high school teacher, they'll move you to vice principal's job. If you're a terrible vice principal, that's where you'll stay. <laughs> the fact is, you are great early childhood educator, but you've now been pushed both with salary and quote unquote promotion to a higher position, so you're no longer doing what you do well and you love because the rewards were supposedly so much greater at this higher falutin position where you now find yourself miserable and resented by everyone because you're not good at your job. Now that's how the rules say you're supposed to live. If you tell someone, you know what, I'm going to turn down promotion because I actually really like doing what I'm doing. People will go, what's wrong with you? Then you won't have the trappings of success. <laughs> you won't be able to buy better stuff. Are you crazy? Live to be happy. Live to be happy and self-satisfied. When you're happy and self-satisfied, you've got it made. Okay? To win the game of life, each day, you must feel that you are on the right track. You are doing the necessary things to bring you to where you'd like to be. You feel that you are sufficiently along on your journey, and you're happy. Happy and self-satisfied. And then you feel great. And things are great. That brings me to an important thing. There's a huge difference fundamentally in the mindset between the masculine and the feminine that can be summarized very simply. For the masculine person, when everything is OK, things are great. For the feminine personality, it's not necessarily gender linked, it's personality type. There are plenty of males who have a tremendously feminine personality type. For the feminine personality type, when they feel OK, everything's great. Okay? For the male masculine personality type, when things are OK, they feel great. The other, when they feel OK, things are great. So there will be plenty of situations where a woman doesn't feel very good, and everything is obviously terrible. And as men, we hear this, we want to fix everything, because we want to jump into action. We want to solve problems. 
It's how we prove our value. But the woman can feel crappy and have absolutely no relationship to what's going on in her world. She feels crappy from the inside. It doesn't have anything to do with what's going on. And so we all scramble madly to try and please her. And she wonders what's wrong with us. Why can't we just accept that she feels crappy? So as men, we need to recognize that we tend to project onto women all the time. And because of this, we build huge resentment against women because women are not like us. Well, guys, guess what? If you wanted to sleep with people who were like you, fuck men. <laughs> <laughs> women are not men thank goodness <clears throat> women are very different in a bunch of ways men tend to deal with one another through a sense of establishing position and hierarchy a bunch of guys get together if one of them says ah oh, my steering wheel wobbles on the freeway he can count on one of the other guys say, what's wrong with you? You don't want to fix that? It's really simple. It's probably your whatever it is, right? Your tires are out of balance, right? Oh, I can fix that for you, says another guy. What's wrong with you? You don't want to fix your car? Jesus, right? In other words, as soon as a man announces he's got a problem, he encourages other men to step up and demonstrate how cool and powerful they are because they wouldn't be stopped by that problem. A bunch of women get together. First one says, oh, my tires are wobbling on the freeway. Second one says, yeah, I know what that's like. My, my automatic windshield wipers won't work in intermittent. Next one says, yeah, I've got a brake light out and I haven't figured out how to fix it. Next one will say, yeah, my brakes squeak like crazy when I come to a stop. Every single one of those women know how to solve their problem. They're not looking to other women to tell them how to fix it. Not looking for other women to jump up and say, I'll fix that for you. They just want to know they're being heard. They're simply stating their situation. That's all. A guy hangs out with a bunch of girls. Girl one says, oh, my steering, my, my steering wheel wobbles on the freeway. Oh, I can fix that for you. I know what that is. I'm good at that. I can fix that. Because he wants to feel big and powerful. Just like he would with his guy friends, only now he thinks, if I do nice things for girls, they're going to give me what I want. Oh, and the girl goes, oh, um, yeah, well, sure, that'd be great. The second girl says, yeah, I know what you mean. My, my, my intermittency on my windshield like versus my, oh, I can fix that for you too. I, I've got a Chilton's manual. I, I, I can take care of that. Thinking, hey, I'm scoring great points. These girls are going to love me. Truth is, the girls are going, what's wrong with this guy? Does he think we're children? Does he think we don't know how to fix our cars? What is it with this guy? Third girl says what her problem is. And he says, oh, I'll fix that for you. He thinks he's being their hero. And they're all looking at him. What the hell is wrong with this guy? Right? And he thinks they're all going to appreciate him. They're not. They're going to let him indulge himself by putting a lot of work into fixing their cars. Not one of them asked for this. There's no contract of appreciation. They're going to say, well, um, sure, great. Yeah. They don't even need to say thanks. And yet, like idiots, men fail to recognize this is what's going on, and then they become resentful as hell when they put in a lot of hours, and the girls feel that they've done them a favor. Because they have. The girls put up with the guy. Maybe they fed him, cooked some food for him. They didn't need him to do this. They indulged his ego. Okay? Now, every once in a while, you find some crafty girl. She'll recognize this is the fact. She'll hang out with a bunch of guys. And she'll list off the litany of things wrong, wrong with her car. And guys will step up and say, I can fix that for you. And then she'll say the next one, oh, I can fix that for you. Each one of them trying to outdo themselves. She'll get her car fixed for free and owe them nothing. And the other girls will think she's a whore. <laughs> and the guys will think she's a gold digger. See, a gold digger is just like a whore, only smarter, because she doesn't have to put out. And we men, we set ourselves up for this because we project onto other people the things that would happen for us. I'll give you a perfect example. Guys, there's a magical combination that is required for a normal average man to become sufficiently aroused by a new potential partner to want to engage in sex with her. In other words, in order to get a stiffy, you need an almost unbelievably uncommon combination of traits 
to take place in a single person at the same time. She needs to be hot enough and the pure willing. Now, you know how rare that is, right? <laughs> it's almost mystical how frequently you find someone who's both hot enough and appears willing, but it depends on the hour of the day. As the hours get later and the drinks get shorter, probably more and more <laughs> they'll start showing up. Now the thing is, most guys figure that if they were a pretty lady, like the pretty lady here in the back of the room, they would know they could get laid on the streetcar. Because of course everyone would be willing. So it would just be a question of finding someone who's hot enough. Right? Well, guys, by the same token, any of you guys can get onto a streetcar and announce, I will fuck anyone who wants to fuck me. <laughs> and guys will come out of the woodwork for you. <laughs> Except that probably doesn't appeal to you, because what you actually want is you want someone you're turned on by to come out of the woodwork. And that's hard for you to find. Well, guess what? It's also murderously hard for women to find. Because unlike men who only require hot enough and willing, women require an entirely different set of absolutely essential things in order to find a man arousing. So it's crazy to think that women are all so spoiled or, my God, that girl, she insists on someone ridiculously hot. Brent, whose space I'm filling right now is a dear friend, and Brent's a very nice looking guy, a real silver fox. And both Brent and I acknowledge and understand that either one of us could have hooked up with the same girl, just a question of who met her first, despite the fact he's gorgeous looking, and I'm certainly not. Because what a woman finds attractive is trivial. Trivial. At the outset. Because once a woman has found you interesting and compelling and arousing, when she's on her own time, fantasizing and masturbating, your face will show up in her list of faces, because pretty much every face of every guy that she's ever met flashes through her mind, whether she's met them or just seen them on movies and TV. And if you're a quality guy and you hold your own and you're masculine enough and confident enough and you don't look like you're needy, occasionally she'll see you and she'll start to reframe in her mind that you are becoming more and more her type. Fascinating thing. Before Tony Soprano became a thing on television, my hot or not rating was about 3.5. After Tony Soprano became something on TV, my hot or not rating came up to about 6.5. <laughs> because once women started fantasizing about a tall, sweltering, furry, balding, powerful, masculine, dominant, a uh, Mediterranean-looking swarthy dude, suddenly I fit the bill. I had nothing to do with it. Okay. World changed for me. So I changed my hair and look so that I wasn't capitalizing on James Gandolfini's turf. I didn't want girls going to bed with me for the wrong reason. I wanted them to go to bed with me because they liked me. Okay. I'd been a player for a lot longer than the show The Sopranos was on the air. Now, you see, I consider life a game, and I play it very, very well. I have a tremendous, tremendous number of friends, many of whom I made myself. <laughs> or at least I helped them construct themselves until they became the sort of people I wanted to spend time with, not because they were paying me to pay attention to them, but because they were actually really cool, worthwhile people on their own. And they weren't carrying a whole bunch of bogus, garbage frames, you know, junk ideas that were holding them back and convincing them they weren't good enough for the people that they'd like to enjoy. So as soon as people start to throw away the crap that keeps them from succeeding, they start to succeed. And the more they succeed, the more successes they have, the more full of successes they become. They become successful. And the amazing thing is almost everyone understands wrongly what a success is. See, everyone thinks a success is a favorable or desirable outcome from an attempt, right? But I challenge you all, look up in your dictionary, look up in dictionary.com, and it lists the original meaning, now considered obsolete, for success. 
It says, an outcome. Any outcome is a success. As a matter of fact, each success is a successive success in a successive series of succeeding successes, each one succeeds the last one. A succession of successes. The king is succeeded by the prince. This doesn't mean the prince is better than the king. Merely, he's the next one in line. It's the one that came afterwards. So every attempt you make yields a success, even if it's an undesirable success, a success you didn't want. So if you want to become successful, you have to have a lot of successes. This means you've made a lot of attempts. A lot of attempts are going to have results you don't like very much. But as long as you don't treat them as losses, and instead remember their lessons, never a loss, only a lesson, and you guide yourself by what you learn from each example, you get closer and closer to what you'd really like with every attempt. So in truth, when your ego tries to stop you from walking over and saying hi to the beautiful girl that you see at the other end of the room, you're thinking, ooh, I'd really like to go meet her. Your ego speaks up, what's wrong with you? That's crazy talk. Remember what happened last time you could try to go talk to some girl? Or she wants someone taller than you, or better hung than you, or nicer looking than you, with a bigger wallet than you. She wants someone more together than you, someone who likes himself more than you. So you go, oh yeah, well, that's probably true. All right, I'm better off not to make an attempt. So what happens when you make no attempt? No attempt, no success. In other words, failure, which is the opposite of success, comes from only one thing, no attempt. Failure to engage is the only failure. And every single time that you choose to listen to your ego, which is only interested in protecting itself and doesn't give a shit about you, every time you listen to your ego as it tells you not to try something that makes sense to you to try. You fail in exactly the same way. So, doing the same thing over and over again, knowing in advance that it's a failure, well, that's about as stupid as it gets. Okay? Making the same mistake again and again and again well, that's about as dumb as it gets. So you have to be humiliated psychologically. You need to take this into the forefront of your mind every single time you allow your ego to stop you. You have to go, oh, I made this mistake before. <laughs> right? Making the same action again and again, expecting a better result, well, that's madness. Right? Repeating the same mistakes again and again, it's as stupid as it gets. And what could be more humiliating then recognizing I have just disappointed myself, I have to li live with the sense of shame of my being a coward, too lazy to learn a new lesson by giving something a try. Okay? So what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? You go over and you try and start a conversation with a girl, worst thing that's gonna happen is, the very worst thing, truly, unless you're in a particularly Hispanic neighborhood where a bunch of her husband's friends are gonna knife you for talking, Generally speaking, worst thing that's going to happen is she's not going to be interested. Now, at my level, the worst thing that's going to happen is she's not going to be interesting. Okay? I'm never rejected. Truly, I'm never rejected. I go up and talk to women all the time. I'm never rejected. I'm not never rejected because every girl wants to get to know me. I'm never rejected because I'm never going over there to offer anything. I'm going over to find out if I can stand her. And I know this is true for a whole bunch of men in this room. Many guys you'll see wearing shirts like this are exactly the same as I am. Our attitude is very aloha. We have made peace with ourselves in the world. We like ourselves. If you ask any of us, you ask Alan, you ask Zan, you ask Eric, who's following me, you say, hey, if you met you tomorrow, would you want you as a friend? And the answer, I guarantee you, would be fuck yeah. Shit, I would love that more than anything. Okay? If your answer is not, fuck yeah, to the question, would you want you as a friend with exactly the same history you've got? You know all your deepest, darkest secrets. 
You know whether you're a bullshit artist. You know whether or not you let people down all the time. Okay? You know whether or not you feel unworthy of the things that you've got. Okay? So you meet yourself. And if the answer to the question, would you like to meet yourself? Would you like yourself as a friend? Would you choose you as a friend? If the answer is not, fuck yeah, you have to chase that down and fix those problems. Don't worry about getting girls. Worry about getting to a place where you know you're worthwhile. Then, you no longer have to prove yourself to women and get the sense that they accept you. Who the fuck cares if some random stranger who you've never met before likes you on first meeting? All you know about a pretty girl across the room is you find her attractive. You find her attractive, this is an automatic function. You find yourself attracted to her. You know nothing else about her. You have no idea if she's as smart as a bar of soap. Okay? You just know that you're turned on by her in the moment. So deciding how you're supposed to feel about you based on what she thinks of you is not only irresponsible, but nuts. Remember that whole thing about not craving the approval of strangers? That whole thing about not feeling you have to give in to your fear of disapproval from other people? Interesting thing yesterday, I was listening, there was some concern about the fact that France had made a law that said that men could not approach women on the street and ask them for their phone numbers. Men could not harass women <laughs> with catcalls and things like this. And of course, most of us in the room, being men, we thought, oh, how weird that they should have that crazy law. I want to give you a frame to think about for just a moment before you go off on that tack. If some six foot seven bodybuilding auto worker or construction worker, a guy, came up to you and said, hey, hey, hot stuff, what's your phone number? That make you feel good? Or maybe, maybe creep you out a little bit? Remember body dimorphism. Human males are generally much, much larger and stronger than human females. So imagine yourself for a moment, being a five foot five, 115 pound girl, the sort who you might think is really cute, remember that you, being your size, are intimidating as fuck. If you come over to her and for no reason that she can understand, you ask her for a phone number? That's pretty imposing. Walk up to some stranger with an unrequested compliment that makes her think, well, maybe this person is a bizarre sexual predator. Am I in jeopardy here? So take a moment and think about it from that perspective. It'll really change things for you. Now the truth is, I've often said, walking up to an endless, an endless number of women and trying to start conversations with them, or walking up to an endless number of women just because you're playing a numbers game out, is pretty obnoxious. All you're generally doing is bothering women. Women don't want to be bothered. Women want to become hot and bothered. <laughs> okay? Women want someone who arouses them. So here's the miraculous bit. Okay? And I'm going to need to go really quickly on this because my time is running out. Fortunately, I've published this in other places, but I'm going to make sure I go through this because it's really very important. There are four things that every woman who's in love with a man believes about that man. These four things are that that man presents as a powerful masculine presence who loves and respects himself. That is to say, he knows who he is, he accepts his mistakes, he's confident in his power, he likes himself, and he will not bend, he will hold his frame, and therefore women will respect him because he clearly respects himself. And no woman can become aroused by a man who doesn't respect himself. The second thing is, he's comfortable enough and confident enough in himself that he can make decisions and go ahead with them, thereby leading himself and whoever else is around, ideally on adventures she would enjoy. As Zazan says, every woman wants to be taken on an adventure by a man. She doesn't want to be that man's adventure. She wants the man to lead. Women have evolved to crave being able to put themselves in the hands of someone who will lead them because it's very comforting, it's very accommodating, and she'll feel safe and secure. Women have evolved to be able to sense from across the room what a man believes about himself. 
When a woman sees a guy who's looking over and going, I wish, oh, I wish I could get with that girl, but she's way too good for me, the girl will follow that man's lead and recognize that she's way too good for him. Guy walks up to a girl feeling he's awesome, totally comfortable with himself. There's nothing wrong with him. He's not going over to her to get her to validate him. He's going over there to find out whether he can like her. And she sees him as a masculine presence who likes and respects himself. And suddenly he's in the game. She doesn't try and blow him off like a cockroach. She goes, all right, this guy seems to like himself. That's rare. What, one in 20 men? Love and respect themselves? Maybe. Okay. So the second part, being able to lead himself on adventures that she would enjoy. What percentage of men are independently minded enough to be able to make decisions, make a call of what they'd like to do, and are comfortable enough and playful enough, they don't treat life too seriously, that they're fun. They do things that suit them. Okay. Still an even tinier number. The third one is, he must love and appreciate women as women. He's not carrying any hatred for women. He's not thinking, oh, those women, they're awful, they're terrible, the terrible things they've done to me. My last girlfriend did this. This girlfriend never did this for me, even though I gave her everything. They have gotten past the suggestion that women are supposed to be sex machines into which you put enough good deed tokens, and eventually sex falls out. <laughs> That's not how women are. Women are people, they need to become aroused before they want to engage in sex with you. Okay? But in order to be arousing, you must demonstrate those first three traits, or at least they must assume them to be true about you. In other words, when a girl's infatuated with you, she definitely sees you as a powerful masculine presence who loves and respects himself, who's capable and willing to make decisions for himself and is playfully confident in leading himself and whomever else on adventures she would enjoy. And clearly, he loves and appreciates and respects women, treasures them, needs to have them in his life. Okay. And the fourth one, the one that's super important for a woman to truly believe and feel she's in love with the man, he must demonstrate in an, an absolutely clear way that he is not only attracted to her and aroused by her, but he is interested in who she is as an individual. He must care about what makes her tick, what turns her on, what upsets her, why she cares about things. He must take an active interest in learning about her and who she is. Now, every woman in the world who's in love with her partner sees these four things in abundance, and therefore she will describe him as the sort of man who could have any woman he wanted. Because any man who displays those first three could have any woman he wanted as soon as he turns that fourth one on to her in particular. Okay? First three are absolutely the same for all women. The fourth one is where he's interested in her as an individual. So every girl who's in love with her partner sees him as fantastic for her, the sort of man who could have any man, who could have any woman that he wanted. That's exactly the right place you want to be. You want to be the sort of man who it doesn't require infatuation chemistry. <laughs> it doesn't require the girl have a mad crush that's not based in reality. You want her to recognize that you are, in fact, a man who loves and respects himself, who's made peace with who he is, who's thrown away the garbage that's stopping him from being able to accept himself, okay. who's comfortable and confident in reasoning to make decisions for himself so he can choose what to do, go ahead and do it with sublime, happy confidence, recognizing that even if it's outside of his traditional stuff, he's already learned his security comes from his ability to adapt. When the bad shit comes down, he gets out of the way, or he opens an umbrella, or he does whatever he needs to, but he makes it through. Because security is what you can do for yourself as an individual or what you can get assistance from other people for so that you can manage. Okay. So a man who loves and respects himself, understands his motivations, forgives his mistakes, gets on with his life. Everyone respects this, male and female alike. Okay. The guys who don't get stopped by something unexpected 
or undesirable or the failure of something they've been counting on to come together. Those are the guys we look at as heroes. Right? Okay. The guys who get shit done. Who do we look to for advice? The people who seem to know what the fuck to do. Okay. So when you have forgiven yourself for all of your mistakes, having recognized that understanding them, recognizing what you did that caused the mistake or caused the result that you didn't want, so that you tune and repeat not making that mistake so that your next success will be closer to an ideal success. As you become successful, right? Everyone knows the master has failed more times than the novice has attempted, right? You don't develop a new skill you don't even improve old skills without first being prepared to go further than you know you can accomplish. When I was a teenager, I did a lot of skiing. One day, I, I skied down the toughest runs, the toughest runs, I'm sorry, I just screwed up my mic, toughest runs uh, at uh, Whistler Mountain in Blackcomb Mountain, British Columbia. Big mountain. I came back, and there wasn't a drop of moisture on the outside of my ski equipment. My father looked at me and said, what were you doing all day? I said, I did this run and this run and this run, all the triple challenging ones, the off route ones, the forbidden to do unless you're ski patrol, you know, double black diamonds, all the things. He said, yeah, but you weren't trying hard. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you didn't fall, your suit is dry. If you weren't falling, you weren't improving. Boy, did that fuck with my head. But he was right. Until you are prepared to move out of your comfort zone, nothing new will happen. Every woman in the world wants a man that she can feel comfortable and confident in, knowing that with love and appreciation and affection and goodwill towards her, he will make decisions that she can be confident, take her into account, so that she can relax and feel secure. And every single person in the room has the potential to be that sort for not just a particular woman, but for every woman you meet from now on. As soon as you make peace with yourself and throw away the crufty, useless shit that's holding you back. None of it is real. So, I'm, as far as I know, the world's only professional personal development guru who offers a lifetime money-back guarantee on my work. Why do I do this? Because nobody ever asks for their money back. <laughs> I'm very good at what I do. The good news is, I love that I was invited to speak here, to speak here today. Anthony, I super appreciate it. Guys, I hope you've taken some value from what I've been talking about. Anyone who wants to get in touch with me, I'm called Johnny Soporno. There's pretty much no other Sopornos out there because it's not actually a real name. <laughs> Having worked in the adult industry for about 25 years, when The Sopranos became a popular show and everyone started asking me for Tony Soprano's autograph, the name Soporno became completely obvious and self-evident, and I've been using it ever since. Okay. You can find me online, you can find me on Facebook, with the help of Zan and, and uh, Hypnotica and Brent, usually, and a whole bunch of other really super guys. We put on an enormous workshop in January every year in Vegas. If anyone's interested in attending, I'll make arrangements to give you guys a special incentive discount because, hey, you guys already have some stuff going. Gentlemen, I appreciate your attention. I hope I've been helpful. And again, Anthony, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Give it up for Johnny Sporno.